Uh, and with that, let us start it. Uh, I'll try to cover today basic principles behind virtual networking, uh, which is a um, thing that is not entirely new, uh, but I would say it's one of the most interesting topics of uh, current days in networking and connection world. So with that said, uh, let's look at uh, let's look at some history and how networks became virtual. So traditional networking, we have a company. The company has servers. Uh, okay, sorry. So if uh, okay, I hear there are some issues with my. Microphone, um, sorry for that. I can try to fix it very quickly. No, I cannot. Sorry. <laughs> My mic is on the lowest level. Uh, I will try not to be so loud. Uh, so we have a company that has uh, its own data center or server room if you want with a lot of servers and on those servers there are of course applications running and those applications are talking with each another over as you guessed a network uh, usually that uh, would be an ethernet and there's a local area network or lan uh, and the servers are just visible to each other on the network and have IP addresses assigned and all of that and talking to each other or the applications rather. Now, this is not something that most or many companies do nowadays because it uh, has some disadvantages. So what's happening or what has been happening for some time is migrating to a cloud. So all of those servers are virtualized, they become become virtual machines and are put to Amazon, Amazon Cloud or Google or whatever. Uh, and, ah, okay. Uh, and um, now there's a problem. They are still the same applications running and they want to communicate over a local network, except in, in cloud, in that um, th uh, third party data center, the virtual machines are not running actually on the same machine, yeah, in the same, even not in the same data center. What's worse, those virtual machines can migrate from single physical machine or from one single physical machine to another. They can be even like in different countries. And those legacy apps that want to communicate over a virtual over a local network, they still should continue working. Well, now imagine that this is not just a single company migrating to cloud, that's actually multiple companies or many companies even migrating to the same cloud, sharing the same virtual machines, meaning, uh, sorry, sharing the same physical machines, meaning virtual machines from several different customers of their cloud vendor can coexist on the same physical machines. All of those should be somehow connected by a local network. So how to do that? We need somehow the same way that we presented uh, or that we pretend to the uh, customers of the cloud that their physical machines are running somewhere, but they are in fact virtual machines. We need to present to them a network that appears to those virtual servers, virtual machines, as a physical network, but in fact, it's virtualized on top of the physical infrastructure of the cloud. So we need some kind of virtual 
local networks, virtual links between machines, and virtual switches, of course. So this is the motivation, and now let's look how can we address this problem. Virtual LAN, obviously. One of the oldest attempts at virtual LAN is IEEE 802.1Q, which is called VLAN most often. It's quite old standard, it's from 1998 already. And what it does is that it adds a special field or have a special subheader, I would say, into Ethernet header, adding, among other things, a VLAN DAG, which is a 12-bit number identifying a virtual network. So this is a number, just number of network. Well, that means we have like 496 different values, two of them are reserved, so that leaves us with 494 different VLANs. Now support for this is quite common. The um, hardware switches are capable, I mean, what you can buy on in your uh, favorite computer shop, the switches usually can understand VLANs. Uh, you can set up VLANs there. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen that, this is how this works. You can set up some switch ports have access ports, some as trunk ports. Uh, to access port, you like plug in your machine. Now, speaking about physical machines, we'll get to virtual machines a bit later. So you can uh, plug in your physical machines, set up the port as access port, and the switch will automatically add a VLAN tag on uh, all packets that are uh, that it receives on that port and it strips uh, packets that it, uh, that it is sending to that port. Of course, it's sending only the packet with appropriate VLAN tag there. Uh, it's kind of partitioning of the switch. So those uh, different access ports for different groups, they cannot talk with each other. And the trunk ports are kind of like thing that aggregates or can aggregate traffic from several different VLANs and the, the VLAN tags are kept uh, in those. Now this is not that important, I'm just saying that for completeness, if you're interested in then just look it up somewhere on the internet. Uh, what's important to us here is that it allows uh, different machines on single switch uh, to have several groups of machines that uh, cannot communicate between those groups, only inside a single group. Which is what we wanted. If we somehow make this switch virtual and plug in all our virtual machines into this virtual switch or software switch, as it is traditionally called. Indeed, there is a software switch, actually several different solutions. In Linux, there's a bridge module that comes out of box. It is VLAN capable, so it can do everything I said. So yeah, we can set up network virtualization with this. And indeed, there are solutions based on that. Now, this is not that easy, because VLAN has several problems. First of that, if we take a data center and migrate it to a cloud, it might appear, or it may happen, that, the, that that customer is actually already using VLANs. And in fact, it happens quite often. Hmm. That's bad. How can we solve that? Well, uh, there's a newer standard called IEEE 802.1 AD, which is uh, informally called Q in Q, which solves it in a way that it adds another VLAN tag to the Ethernet header, or even more than one. So you, instead of a single VLAN tag, uh, it becomes a stack of VLAN tags. That means that you can take, or the switch can take the traffic from the from the cast, uh, from that uh, virtual, virtual or physical machine that already has VLAN tag and slap another VLAN tag on top. Okay, next problem. There is a limited number of IDs in uh, in the VLAN uh, tag, um, 
Um, having only 4,000 customers might be quite limited if you want to grow your cloud business. How to solve that? Well, you can use Q and Q and Q again and like combine those tags to offer more uh, combinations, which, by the way, is quite madness. Not at least because not that many uh, hardware and software switches support Q and Q. Third problem, VLAN does not work over the Ethernet. Obviously, Internet is uh, one layer above, that's IP, not Ethernet. Well, bad luck. You cannot solve this using VLAN, so we need something other. And that's something other is tunneling. How did it or IP tunneling for the Internet? How does it work? We have a packet. So this is a packet that uh, came from the customer, yeah, from the virtual machine. Contains some headers. It would be most of an Ethernet header, IP header, and then some TCP, UDP, whatever, and data. Now, if this packet is to be forwarded to another data center over, over the Internet, what happens is that it is put as a payload, as data, to another packet. And that one is sent over the internet. So when your packet is from the VM is to leave the, uh, the, the cloud or leave the data center, it is encapsulated in this way, sent over the internet to the other data center, then when it, in, when, it, uh, when it is received there, it is decapsulated, meaning the outer headers are removed, and then it's switched inside that other data center. So yeah, that works. It's pretty well, actually. Uh, it works so well that there are at least dozen or several dozen of standards. Uh, I will mention only three of them. That's GRE, Genetic Road Encapsulation. Uh, this is um, one of the oldest, actually, uh, IP tunneling protocols. Uh, it, is, um, it is an IP protocol, so it's on the same level as TCP and UDP. Uh, then, which has some problems because it cannot pass some, uh, some routers and so on on the Internet. So a new standard was born called VXLAN, which is really similar, except it's... Uh, encapsulated inside an UDP header. So it's actually a UDP packet, which contains the original packet. Generally, really similar to VXLAN, but more advanced, more features, and so on. Now, I said that uh, the packets, when they are leaving the, uh, the, the data center, that they are encapsulated. Yeah, but there's a problem. How can we decide what packets should be forwarded to the other data centers and which should be switched inside the data center we are in? So remember, uh, the, uh, the virtual machines can be located on different physical machines, so the, uh, the data center or infrastructure must be clever enough to know what is uh, what is uh, switched between the machine uh, between the virtual machines on a single machine physical physical machine? What should be uh, forwarded between different physical machines in the same data center? Or what should, you know, what, should go, what should go out to a different data center? So how can we decide? No, well we have the obvious two options. We can use either routing or switching for decision. Well, there's nothing more we can use. It's either of those two. So let's look at them and let's get into more details. <coughs> routing. So let's say that we set up routing tables that will decide based on the IP address. Uh, we will know or somehow the infrastructure will know whether a machine, a virtual machine with this IP address is located in this data center or the one that's far away. Uh, 
And based on the IP addresses, it's either routed in a single data center or encapsulated and routed in the other data center. Okay, that should work. The problem here is that routing decisions happen inside the customer local area network. Yeah. And that means if we would like to route that, we would have to configure the routing inside the customer's infrastructure. So it would not be transparent to the customer. Well, it is doable. Uh, we have VPNs after which are basically the same principle. Uh, we can use BGP or something like that to configure that automatically even. Still, the problem is it needs cooperation from the customer. So you cannot, the customer cannot just take his current kind of infrastructure and just put it into the cloud and be done with it. That would not be possible. Another problem, uh, yeah, with migration, uh, when VVMs are migrated, all of that would have, all the routes would have to be changed. As I said, we can use BGP or something like that. So yeah, solvable, but not pleasant. Let's look at switching. Switching has the nice advantage that it's completely transparent to the virtual machines because the switching, yeah, those are connected to uh, virtual switches, which are uh, at the control of the data center uh, or of the cloud vendor. So those could be, I mean, sorry, the physical switches between those machines and yeah, uh, also software switches on those uh, physical machines that the virtual machines are connected to. We'll cover it a bit later. Uh, so all of those switches are in the control of the cloud vendor. So there's not, nothing the customers must configure on their side, which is nice. The disadvantage is that those switches need to look inside the IP headers to find out, okay, yeah, this is going to another data center. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of a layering violation because switch is a true Ethernet. It should not be looking to the upper layers. On the other hand, Switch is already doing that, so yeah, whatever. There are some problems with this. Uh, there are actually some even unsolved problems with this, but it mostly works surprisingly. <clears throat> so this is what is actually used. Now, the problem is the migration, of course. So if you migrate a single machine or a single virtual machine, uh, to another physical machine or even to a data center, we need to reconfigure all the switches that are between uh, between the the, 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 con the communication path. Uh, now, how can we do that? So for the finite working, it comes to rescue. First, let's look what the switch is. The typical switch serves two different functions. If you think about it, the first function is moving packets around, moving it from one port to another, uh, adding VLAN tags, removing VLAN tags, so in short, modifying the packets. And the second function is the management. So there's something, some, some configuration interface that allows the administrators to configure the switch, to set the VLANs, uh, partition the switch, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the first function uh, boils down to looking up some tables of rules inside the switch. And the second function boils down to configuration of those rules. Yes, which contains some kind of row tables chained together. Yeah, so especially the modern switches. So the switch is looking into that while switching and those tables need to be configured somehow. The first thing, the movement of packets, the lookup in the, in the row tables is called data plane. The second function, the configuration is called control plane. Remember those terms. So let's look at the control plane. If you have some experience with uh, top of the rack switches, uh, traditional top of the rack switches, those physical boxes that you can buy, uh, those uh, 
are usually configured using some vendor specific tool or web page you connect to that uh, to that switch using this IP address and so on uh, so this is not much friendly this cannot be automated so imagine if we had some kind of control API that would be common for all vendors of all switches if you're familiar with routing with BGP yeah think of BGP for routers uh, sorry, think of VGP for switches. And indeed, there's a standard for, the, for that called OpenFlow. And some other standards, of course, there's uh, never only one standard. Uh, so, but OpenFlow is what will, uh, what I base my later examples on, or examples like, more like talking on. Uh, <coughs> So what's but when I, now we can explain what software defined networking. Well, that's just a fancy name for having a common API to switch control plane. Basically, that's it. Uh, it's uh, traditionally assigned with with, uh, with OpenFlow protocol, but nowadays used more broadly. Uh, so, yeah, that's SDN. Uh, we have what well, that is uh, a software implementation of uh, SDN switch called OpenV switch. So OpenV switch is uh, actually a switch that is configurable uh, using OpenFlow. It's quite advanced switch. You know, it can do a lot more than just adding and removing VLAN tags uh, and of course moving packets around. It's fully programmable. Uh, there's a lot you can configure there and one of the things that you can do is actually uh, encapsulate packets and decapsulate them so we get tunnel encapsulation in open switch direct, directly in the switch yeah if you think okay yeah that's quite gross sliding violation yeah it is it works though at least good enough so that's what is actually used. Now <coughs> we have an we can think of open switch or some hardware switch. Those are as capable as some of them are as capable as open switch. So we have some switches that decide on a set of rules that as we Explain can be configured remotely. So based on this configurable set of rules, they decide that certain packets should be switched inside the data center and certain packets should be encapsulated and sent out to the internet. Nice. It should work. And we can use VLANs for partitioning of uh, virtual machines inside a single data center. Yeah? This will work somehow. Yeah, except uh, of course, uh, the problems I mentioned, like 4,000 limit of the, for the customer and queuing queue necessity and so on. Yeah. But there's another problem I did not mention and that is important. If we use this solution, there's no clean separation between the Virtual between the customer's virtual area network, uh, sorry, local area network, and between the physical network as deployed in the data center. If you think about it, if the VM sends a packet, it has like Ethernet header, IP header, and so on, the switch puts a VLAN tag on top of the Ethernet header. The Ethernet header is still the, is still the same, and it traverses the physical network of the cloud vendor with the same Ethernet header that the customer's virtual machine set. That brings several problems. First, mega addresses must be unique across all customers. Oops, this. There's no way we can achieve that. Those are virtual machines. The customers can set the mega addresses whatever way they like. Yeah, we can play some game with the switches, like take the VLAN tag into account while switching. It's probably solvable with some 
substantial price. But it is a problem, it is a problem to solve. Another problem is that we said we have a nice SDN solution and the switches, we can configure those switches uh, like uh, from a central place. But this traffic is intermingled with a traffic from the customers. So if we're not really, really, really careful, the customers might be able to influence or to configure our the, the data center switch or the, vendor, the, the cloud vendor switches, which is something that's not at all desired. <coughs> and so on and so on. So there are more problems like that. How we solve those? Well, if you think what we deployed, what we have configured so far, we have uh, we have switches that are clever, uh, smart switches, configurable remotely everywhere. They are capable of tunneling. We need tunneling between data centers anyway. Yeah. So what if we just tunnel everything, including the traffic in the same data center? This idea is called overlay network. Basically, you take the physical network and you, you create a network on top. Fully, completely virtual. No, uh, no uh, mingling between, between packets of uh, the, the overlay, the virtual network, and the physical network. How does it work? So let's... Uh, Take this example, we have a cloud, we have um, a few physical machines in there and each of them is uh, running several virtual machines. Those virtual machines on the, uh, on the physical machine are connected to a virtual switch and then physical machines are connected by physical switch. Now, when two virtual machines are talking with each other on the same physical host uh, over the virtual switch, it's just switched. Yeah, because the virtual switch receives the packet and it just like sends it to another port. That works. If rather we want or the we, we the virtual machines are located on uh, different physical machines, then the virtual switch encapsulates the packet in an IP tunnel and sends it to the IP address of the destination physical machine which uh, in its virtual switch decapsulates that packet and sends it to the target virtual machine. And of course, if the traffic goes to different data center, it works the same way. It's encapsulated, sent to the, and sent from the switch, from the virtual switch to directly to the other uh, physical machine at the other uh, cloud, at the other location. Yeah, so from the point of view of virtual stations, there's really no difference between traffic to another physical machine in the same data center or a different data center. And as I said, the advantage of this, one of the advantages of this is that the control traffic can share the same physical network. Yeah, it's just not encapsulated. You know, the traffic that's not encapsulated is directly addressed to the physical machine, receives there, and yeah, we're done. That's easy. Now, you may think, okay, I'm talking about all about the virtual machines, but that's so outdated. Everything is Kubernetes now and containers. How does this map to containers? Well, you may be surprised. It's really the same. Network namespaces, uh, sorry, container in Linux are implemented uh, using so-called namespaces, uh, among other things. Uh, and for networking, that's network namespace. Network namespace, that's basically a new instance of the current networking stack. So when the container is launched, a new network namespace is created, and it's like its own networking stack for that single container. Uh, now there is a virtual, there can be a virtual link established between the container and the root namespace. 
yeah, meaning the host. Uh, it's uh, called Virtual Ethernet Link in Linux, VTH. You probably see, uh, saw that. And that's it. So from the point of the host of the of the of the of the switch of the virtual switch, yeah, it's just an interface, Ethernet interface that it can like put packets to and receive from, and that's it. Yeah, so it's really, really, really similar, really similar to a virtual machine. There are some differences, of course. A virtual machine is completely transparent to the host. That for the space can be influenced. So in theory, the the management system on the on the host on the machine can like look into the container yeah do some configuration there and so on but it's probably not a good idea to do that anyway yeah but possible certainly but that's a great more an advantage so um now we explain the basics but there are still some problems that we did not cover let's take this example the same as before, yeah. We have data center and uh, virtual switches, virtual machines. Now, uh, in the picture, you see a server or a virtual machine communicated with another virtual machine. Now they are located on the same physical machines by by chance. They are just communicated. The virtual switch is switching the traffic between those two. Now, that target virtual machine gets more resource hungry. So the, the cloud, the cloud control uh, software decides to migrate that virtual machine to a different physical machine. And it does that. Problem is that now the traffic needs to follow the new location. It needs to be tunneled, which means that all the virtual switches need to be reconfigured. And by saying all, I really mean all, at least all of those that are uh, part or all of the switches that are running on machines or connecting machines where a virtual machine for this particular customer can, can be run. So, yeah, uh, we have the uh, we have SDN for that, right? Problem solved. Well, not really, because that's too low level. I mean, generating all of those open flow rules to all of the switches that's not an easy task. What we are want to do is somehow describe what the what the infrastructure is, what the physical setup looks like, and we want to define logical networks, saying, okay, yeah, those virtual machines are part of uh, this network, and then just like have some API, some command, okay, yeah, now please put this virtual machine on this physical machine, or migrate it, or just tear it down. And this solution should just calculate the, all the open flow rules by itself and configure all the switches by itself. So we want something high level. Yes, there of course is such solution, multiple of those obviously of course. Uh, one quite commonly used is OBM, uh, Open Virtual Network. Uh, it can do, so it's just like really this high level solution with nice API. It can do more than this, more than this guy. It can also set some policies, like security policies. It can do load balancing and, and, and more. Yeah, so it's like very good candidate to use for Kubernetes, CNI, and it is indeed used, for example, in Red Open, Red Open Shift. Yeah, so with that, I think I covered all the essentials. There's a lot, of course, a lot more to it, but I guess that's something for some other talk. Now it's time for the questions, if you have some. So, Michal, could you read it? So, uh, we have a question from uh, Jan Kluka. So what's the cost of having multiple Q in Q in VLAN solution for network virtualization? Is it resource uh, intensive? for switches? Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> yes, of course, it's, uh, uh, well, okay. Uh, it's not that much resource intensive, uh, intensive because, um, I mean, switches can look into higher uh, level uh, uh, headers. 
So it's more like um, quite a bit more difficult configuration. Uh, you will you have to deal somehow with the fact that there can be multiple VLAN tags stacked and it can be made to circumvent some uh, some security measures in the cloud and so on. The more problem is it's not that widely supported. I mean, Open vSwitch does support it. Uh, some hardware switches do support it, but it's not universal. And also there's problem with MTU, of course, because uh, adding adding the, uh, the another VLAN header that adds uh, four bytes, I think, to, to the packet. So you quite easy can go over the MTU. Um, yeah. Any more questions in QA that I don't see? So I can continue. I have two more slides if anyone, okay. So I think I will. We still have two minutes, so. Yeah, so let's go through that. Uh, I put eBPF in the annotation, so I should sorry, I should talk a bit about it. It's related somehow to what I talk about, but not directly. So it's more like a future thing for future, in, an interesting thing for future. So eBPF, if you didn't hear about it, it's uh, eBPF is a bytecode that you can compile your program into and upload it to the kernel. And now your program is actually run by the kernel in the kernel in space uh, as a response to certain events. So you attach your uh, program to some event, some predefined event, not like any event, of course. And uh, I'm sorry, Rekha, it's just that we have uh, one more question if you want to answer it in the chat. Yeah, okay, so let me. Uh, so so uh, do we need to choose switches depending on which protocol we want to use? Easily implemented. Ha! <laughs> this nice question. Uh, yes, basically, yes. You need to uh, you need to uh, choose a switch according to what you need to use. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you want to use DXLAN uh, for for tunneling, yeah, you absolutely have to buy a switch if you want to have a physical switch that can support DXLAN, or support a software switch, or like take a software switch or deploy a software switch that supports this particular. Um, okay, yeah, back to eBPF. Uh, so if you can attach a program to some uh, event like a packet reception, you could in theory use that to build your own virtual switch. You can program that. So you can like look at whatever fields in that packet you want, decide on that, modify the packet and send it out to different interface if you want, including virtual interface. So yeah, this doesn't work that nicely yet. There are still missing features. But still, there are solutions trying to do that, at least in combination with some other features in the kernel. Thank you, and we're out of time. <laughs>